Um, I think it's about time we crack on with the evening, so please, uh, Tom from Kasabian, spread that clatter around the room. Okay. And welcome to the stage, fantastic, and Sarah Roos! my first ever comedy stand-up gig. Um, I've been wanting to do this for a while and um, I, uh, I wrote some material and um, been practicing it in front of friends and stuff and trying to get more fluent. And um, But last night I, w I was in the salutation having a few drinks with some friends and um, and I was at the bar getting around and I started chatting to this guy and um, it turned out he was a comedian. So I, I, uh, I told him about this gig that I had tonight and um, he said that I should do my set for him um, in case he could give me any tips, you know, uh, help me make it better in some way. So I, um, I, did, I did my jokes for him and um, he, and he li he laughed and uh, he liked them. He said he liked them. And um, then he um, then he offered to buy them on the condition that I didn't use them. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was drunk, I guess, and uh, I was also quite flattered. So I said uh, I said yes. And um, I suppose what I thought I'd just do the, the material tonight anyway, just this once, and then just not use it again and um, probably I would have got away with it um, if he wasn't here tonight <laughs> <laughs> um, so now I'm in a bit of a difficult situation because <laughs> I don't really have any other material and um, I'm not very good at spontaneous jokes <laughs> so my only idea is um, to get around this on a technicality um, what I thought I'd do is I'd just do the set but I'll mess up the punchlines <laughs> because it was the it was the jokes that he bought. So I thought if I just leave a pause where the punchline should be, then probably it will be okay. And if the guy who bought my jokes, you know who you are, <laughs> and if you're not satisfied at the end of this gig, um, then you can just come and talk to me, and I just give you your money back. <laughs> okay. So here we go. One night not very long ago, back home in Nottingham, I went to my local bar. It's called the King William. It's a true story, this. And I pushed open the door to go inside. And as soon as I opened the door, I immediately saw that the whole place was packed full of... <laughs> <laughs> there were three at the bar, and four more sat around a table drinking beer and playing cards. And as I walked over to the bar, I saw another to my left on the freight machine. So at this point, that particularly large one pushed past me on the way out, it, out the door. Now, this being a situation rather out of the ordinary, I let that one go and I walked over to the bar to see the same old barman standing where he always stands. His name's Steve. And I said to Steve, hey Steve, what's going on? And he sort of looked around the place a bit nervously and he sort of gave me a look, you know, keep it down, you know. So I wanted to ease the situation, so I turned to the alpaca nearest to me and I said, um, <laughs> can I get you a drink? And it sort of just flared its nostrils a bit, it didn't really respond. So I leant forward and I said to the second alpaca, um, how about you, can I get you a pint? And again, it didn't really respond. But in the meantime, the third alpaca had trotted around the back and was now tapping me on the shoulder. So I turned around to face him and he sort of squared up to me. And by this point, all eyes in the pub were on us. The alpaca pointed to this very cashmere cardigan that I was wearing at the time and said in a loud, clear voice, <laughs> <laughs> Now, what happened next was somewhat indescribable. The alpaca insisted on 
<laughs> so I tried to defend myself by... <laughs> But it was too late. The two other alpacas at the bar began to... <laughs> Which never to be provoked further. <laughs> With more and more alpacas getting involved. Now I was being attacked from every angle, so as a last desperate attempt, I took off my cashmere jumper and I... <laughs> now, who should enter at this heady climax in the heated debate of the quality of hand-spun versus machine-spun wool, but an army of old ladies brandishing knitting needles, and they were fast and on the act pointing out all kinds of assumptions we'd been making in our arguments over the matter previously. The depth of their knowledge and the quality of their knitwear was breathtaking. <laughs> After they had somewhat wiped the floor with the letter and formed our packers, the door opened again, and in walked a priest, a rabbi, and an imam, and they were wearing kind of shabby acrylic pullovers, you know, like the v-neck ones with the worn-out elbows. What a moment. Even Dave, the barman, who's used to neutrality, gave a kind of dis disgusted expression. Now, obviously, the whole place is quite full, and everyone sort of gathers around them trying to see what's going to happen next, and I sort of get pushed pushed back a bit, and it's difficult for me, it's difficult for me to see what was going to go in on next. But I definitely saw the priest do something, and the imam somehow responded to the priest. And then I saw the rabbi shrug, and he made a comment. And I didn't catch what the comment was, but whatever it was, it cleared the place. The alpacas drank up, left with the old ladies in tow. <laughs> now, as at this point, it was starting to dawn on me just how unlikely the situation was turning out to be. And I walked around a bit confused. I leant on the bar. And I pondered, in my slightly bewildered state, I pondered out loud to myself as to what the punchline would be if this were in fact a joke, a fabricated joke and not a real life situation. <laughs> and Dave the barman just absent-mindedly responded with... <laughs> <laughs> Which I think was probably one of the funniest things I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> be a good place for a story to end, but as you know, real life's not like that. So I'm now, <laughs> half, I'm now in a half-empty bar with Dave polishing the taps, and the priest, the imam, and the rabbi, they're sitting around a table, and they ask me to go and join them, so I do, I sit down. And there are kind of dregs of drinks dotted about, left over from the others before, and they each take a glass for themselves, the imam managing to find himself the leftovers and orange juice. And there's silence as they all take a sip in unison. Now, it's starting to dawn on me, maybe this isn't the most cheery group of people. The rabbi is the first one to speak and he says that um, he says he doesn't usually drink but lately he's been finding alcohol a good way to relax and as he says this the priest and the young man kind of are nodding with sympathy but when he finishes they don't encourage him to go on and there's this kind of awkward silence where no one says anything and I don't know what to say. Anyway the rabbi gets up and goes to the toilet and only when he's gone to the toilet does the imam tell me a bit more about the rabbi's situation. He says that uh, the rabbi's been having personal problems because his eldest son, now a teenager, is refusing to take part in Judaism at all. He won't speak Hebrew at home, he won't go to the synagogue. And uh, the rabbi's kind of finding this... It, the communication's breaking down at home, basically. But the other problem is the rabbi's starting to feel like a bit of a hypocrite because he gives advice to his congregation about their personal problems. And as he's not finding pro solutions for his own, you know, he's, he doesn't feel quite right about that. So as the imam's telling me this about the rabbi, I kind of feel like, oh, it'd be nice to help the rabbi out in some way, you know? And I have this idea, I have this idea that if we, me, David the barman, the priest and the imam convert to Judaism, you know, maybe that will cheer him up. It'll give him an opportunity to tell us about his religion, teach us some things. And I tell this idea to the others, and the, the priest and the imam, they look a bit confused. But I say to them, you know, we don't actually have to convert to Judaism. We just go to the synagogue a few times to show a bit of interest, you know. And David the barman's like, yeah, right. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> now, the rabbi's coming back into the room, and uh, the priest and the imam, they give sort of subtle nods, you know, of their approval. 
the rabbi sits down and I tell him our idea. And um, he seemed really happy. Like, I guess he was probably quite amused. Um, I think he probably knew we weren't going to convert to Judaism, but uh, I think he was kind of inspired by our attitude. And um, he seems since much happier. It's been really interesting actually since then. We as a group have been meeting up to talk about stories from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and the Quran, sharing ideas around religion and belief. And I think we've all really benefited from it, you know. So the rabbi seems much happier, and, and I think, on a personal note, I was just saying this today the other day, actually, I think on a more personal note that I feel like I've really gained something from giving up this idea of atheism that I have about myself for lo uh, long enough to discuss with the group about their beliefs, and uh, that's been a very profound experience. So I guess that's what I wanted to sh to share with you really. <laughs> I just think it's really important to realise um, the potential for change that you can have on the world, both on yourself and other people. So, thanks very much for listening. <laughs>